We are going to talk about someone who, wow, when I think about it, had a profound influence on the electric guitar and jazz and pop music in general, including rock and roll. It just occurred to me that he had a short life, the same as Jimi Hendrix. But for his time, he was as influential, if not more influential, than even the great Jimi Hendrix was in terms of the trajectory of the stylings of the electric guitar. Who am I talking about? Well, there can only be one guy, and that is Charles Henry Christian, better known as Charlie Christian, born in 1916 in Bonham, Texas. All I know about Bonham, Texas is there's only about 35,000 people living there now. Black population is less than 8%. And uh, you can imagine how small it was back in uh, 1916. So it wasn't long before the uh, Christian family loaded up and got the heck out of Bonham, Texas. They ended up in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, which is actually comparable to Tulsa in the way that black folks lived and prospered. Just like you had Black Wall Street in Tulsa, you had this area called uh, Deuces in um, Oklahoma City and the Bricktown area. As a matter of fact, Charlie Christian is so well regarded there that uh, there's a street name for him in that Bricktown area. Now, his parents were both musicians. His father played guitar, his mother sang, played piano. They had three kids, um, Edward, uh, Clarence Jr., named after the father, and then it was Charles. Um, Everybody's a musician. So obviously Charles uh, hung out with the musicians. And as a young kid, uh, he was too young to uh, play music or anything, but he would accompany his father and older brothers to these nice neighborhoods where people uh, would reward them for making music and entertaining them. Uh, safe neighborhoods. Uh, the father uh, was uh, legally blind, so he had to trust his sons to lead them to a neighborhood where they would be safe to do what they did in the skin they were in. And that worked out very, very well for the family. Little Charlie uh, couldn't play anything. So he would just stand out front and dance and, 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 and just show out for the people. And he was kind of like a little Michael Jackson of the group kind of thing, you know what I mean? And um, that worked out real well uh, for a while. But um, unfortunately, uh, the father uh, was sickly. And uh, when Charlie was uh, 12 years old, uh, his father passed away. That was uh, a sad thing for the family. But the two brothers uh, could continue to go out and earn money for the family. And so could the mother. And Charlie, inherited his father's guitar. Um, now, there have been other things. You, know, you, you, you have a musical family, you go to a school, your music teacher knows everybody, the first thing they want to do is teach you to play. And in school, they try to teach Charlie to play. He wanted to play tenor sax, but the music teacher insisted he play the trumpet. Uh, she was a trumpet player and a very highly regarded one. Uh, in uh, Oklahoma. But Charlie did not like the way it made his face feel. You know, he thought that, you know, Charlie was kind of a ladies' man too. You know? And he felt that if he played that trumpet, it would mess up his mouth, and so girls would not be so interested in kissing him anymore. So he, he decided he would not play the trumpet, and when the teacher insisted, he dropped out of band altogether and went on to play baseball. And the word is, he was a very, very, very good baseball player. But 
that guitar did not mess up his face. <laughs> Worked out just right for him. And so that is what he learned to play. But he always wanted to play the tenor saxophone, remember that. And you'll hear me refer back to that uh, in a while as it kind of uh, informs uh, his style going forward and his great influence on music in general and the guitar uh, in pop music as well. Uh, so Charlie is working his way through school and the whole thing and everything is going well and uh, his brother had a band and uh, Edward and uh, the trumpet player was someone who Clarence didn't get along with and caused a lot of trouble in the band but Edward was now a fiery guy because there wasn't that many good musicians around. So Clarence Jr. decided to find a tutor for young Charles who would teach him to play a little jazz, teach him to improvise on the guitar on three songs. Because he knew when we go to the jam session, they're going to call one of these three songs. And, and they wanted Charles to be ready. So after the tutoring and after he practiced and learned what he had learned, he was taken to the jam session. And uh, when uh, Edward was asked, hey man, that Charlie play. Edward said, oh man, nobody want to hear no blues. He can't play nothing but the blues. That's the simple music. Anybody can play the blues. We don't want to hear that mess in here tonight. He said, no, he can play more than the blues. So Edward, true to form, called one of those three songs. And Charlie lit up, and so did Clarence Jr. They say, uh huh, we're going to show him now. So little Charlie got up there on stage, and he tore that song up. And in the middle of his performance, people started standing up and cheering. And when he finished, they would not let him leave the stage. He had to play an encore. That goes the second song. And when he finished the second song, they wouldn't let him off stage. He had to play another encore. It's his first jam session. And so he played his third and final song, and the people went nuts again. But this time, he excused himself from the jam session because he knew he was out of gas. But that was enough to convince his brother Edward that Charlie was ready. That trumpet player was gone, and Charlie was in, and he just had to learn a few more songs. But his talent and his ability to improvise and not repeat himself, chorus after chorus after chorus, was very, very clear even at this early age, and um, you know, 15, 16 years of age. So now little Charlie is playing around. And he is playing gigs all around Oklahoma. He's even traveling as far as Minnesota. I mean, they actually get on the road and play it. And Charlie's reputation is growing all over this region. And to make things better, you got nationally known musicians that are coming through, like Art Tatum. When they come through Oklahoma, they hear this little fella play the guitar and they go tell everybody, man, when you go to Oklahoma City, watch out for this boy Charlie. He will cut you up. He can play the guitar. And Mary Lou Williams, same thing. Of course, Mary Lou had connections to Benny Goodman and all kind of people in the industry. She was a big, big name. And Many other musicians came through, and pretty soon everybody knew about Charlie Christian. My dear friend, little Charlie, he is now well known. And there is a record producer who discovered the likes of Billie Holiday and many other black jazz and blues musicians. One of the most famous producers of all time, his name is John Hammond. And finally comes the day when Charlie gets to sit with Mr. John Hammond. And Charlie must be about 17, 18 years old. 
But he sits down and he starts playing his guitar. And John Hammond goes, whoa! You are ready for the big time. And the big time was really what it was because John Hammond also produced the King of Swing, Benny Goodman, baby. Yes, he did. And Benny Goodman was already using an integrated group. So the fact that Chai was black should not be much of a problem. Now, people say that Benny Goodman was the first to hire black stage orchestra. That's not entirely true. There was a guy named, uh, what did they call that guy? Oh yeah, Ragtime Jimmy, who actually had a black clarinet player in his Dixieland type band back in that day. And um, oh yeah, you all might know him as Jimmy Durante. That's right. He started life as a jazz singer, and his first band had a black clarinet player. So Jimmy Durante is the first uh, uh, white guy to employ black musicians in a public uh, performer situation. At any rate, Benny Goodman is impressed, but he's not sold on this Charlie Christian. There's some things about Charlie Christian that trouble him. Charlie Christian had that young attitude. He was much younger and much more forward. And he was a ladies' man. So he had his hair slicked back and he had on jewelry. And he liked to wear loud clothes. You know, those typically white orchestras like to wear their little uh, black tux and white shirts and this. And, you know, Charlie, he was like a purple suit or a green suit or a blue suit or a yellow suit. And this just, no, no, no. So at first, for a lot of reasons, Benny Goodman did not want to have much to do with Bill Charlie Christian. But Johnny Hammond put him on stage, set him up, got his amp situated and everything before Benny Goodman showed up for the gig. And when Benny showed up, Charlie was already sitting on stage in his loud purple suit and his big hat. <laughs> and Benny was like, oh, you did this to me. What am I going to do? I know. I'll fix this. So he called a tune that he just knew this young black musician would not know. A tune was called Rolls Room. And he said, this will get him, but he can't play this. Well, unfortunately for Mr. Benny Goodman, Rose Room was one of the original three tunes that young Charlie had been taught as a kid. So when he called that, Charlie Christian's like, oh yeah, I think I can play that. <laughs> and the legend is, the old man kicked the tune off and he played his little clarinet solo and he was a good clarinet player, he played a great solo. And then he looked at Charlie and Charlie started playing. One chorus, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five, and he kept going. And what was amazing about it is every time he played a different chorus, he didn't play anything from the previous chorus. Every solo he played was brand new. It's like he's creating all of this new improvisational music right on the spot. And Benny Goodman is like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe this. Number one, I didn't think he could play the tune. And number two, he's playing the living heck out of this tune. What am I supposed to do? Hire him. That's what you're supposed to do. So Charlie Christian becomes a member of the Benny Goodman Sextet and Orchestra, 1936, 37. And he stayed with him until he started getting ill around 1940. In one of those breaks when uh, Benny Goodman was having trouble with his back, Charlie Christian went into the hospital to be treated for tuberculosis. Somewhere after about uh, 1941, Charlie Christian left the Goodman organization and could be found in New York hanging out at Minton's Playhouse. 
You say Minton's Playhouse. Come on, you got to remember what I'm telling you all. Minton was a place that Dizzy and Monk and Clark and all the cats that created Bebop hung out. This is where Bebop was born. And the cat who was a regular there was Charlie Christian. As a matter of fact, there are people who say the word Bebop was created by Charlie Christian because he had this manner of singing solos. And because he used that syllabication, it became synonymous with this new music. So he became the platform that Dizzy built upon, that Mary Lou Williams built upon, that Monk and Miles and Kenny Clark, Max Roach, Oscar Pettiford, all the bad cats that were coming through Minton's and creating this bebop in the very, very early ages of the 1940s, 1940, 1941, 1942, they were all under the tutelage of Mr. Charlie Parker. Did I say Charlie Parker? Charlie Christian. Charlie Parker was under the tutelage of Charlie Christian. Yes, that's a fact. Now, somewhere around 1942, uh, Charlie's health deteriorated even further. And uh, in 1942, at the age of 25, he died. His style of playing single notes on the guitar, of improvising multiple choruses over and over and over and over and over, of using an electric guitar, being bodacious enough to use an electric guitar in jazz and pop and music, not just the blues, but jazz and pop and music was revolutionary. And it set in place the platform for everyone who followed him, T-Bone Walker, B.B. King, Carlos Santana, Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton, all of them are the offspring of Charlie Christian, who was only on this planet with us for 25 years and yet left this legacy. Reminds me that Jimi Hendrix was only with us for 26 years. Now, after Mr. Christian died, uh, didn't have a lot of money. He had left the good organization. He was sick, his health trade, he couldn't work a lot. So his body was sent back to um, Bottom, Texas. I assume he still had family there. Um, and perhaps the family in Oklahoma had moved on. I'm not really sure how that happened. But he was sent back to Bottom. And uh, he was placed in an unmarked grave for a long time, from 1942 to about 1994. Unmarked grave for Charlie Christian. I'm going to say it again. Unmarked grave. This is how we pay our genius artists in many cases. Finally, the Historical Society of Texas did put a historical marker up there. Uh, for his grave and a um, tombstone. And in 2003, it was recognized that the marker was placed in the wrong place and that where Mr. Christian was buried was a concrete slab. I do not have an update as to whether or not they actually fixed that situation or not. but. The story is, all of this great music, all this great innovation, all this great joy that we are now getting from the genius of Charlie Christian way back in the 30s and 40s, we paid him back with the Amar grave. But of course, we paid Mozart in the same way. So let's just 
take joy in the fact that this young man lived only 25 years, but his legacy lives with us. In 1990, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's right, rock and roll. And of course, he was dead 10 years before rock and roll was created. But what he did paved the road for the creation of rock and roll. That's right. Downbeat put him in their most honored position of outstanding jazz artists of all time and Oklahoma, when it started its outstanding jazz artist from Oklahoma, Charlie Christian was one of the first to go in to that great honorary place. Charles Henry Christian, 1916, 1942, 25 years old, and yet, look at what he did with those 25 years. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this journey.